Aniigwetja, Bojo, Dunwen Magaletuk. Greetings, everyone. I'm deeply honored to welcome you to this very important gathering on reconciliation here in Canada. It's to honor our children, to make sure they understand where they come from. The prayer is about, you know, the Creator to guide us in all of them of this very important event. Uh, we thought this national day words, uh, Gizemae Dante, Anin, for those of you that don't know, my name is Ray Coco Stevenson. I was given the name Walking Wolf over 35 years ago. We're going to get things started with a song that I composed over 20 years ago. I use it as an honor song. I'm Brenda Gunn, the Academic and Research Director at the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation. Today marks the beginning of Truth and Reconciliation Week 2022. We're so excited to have you join us to learn about Indigenous peoples, languages, culture, as well as the history of residential schools, including hearing from residential school survivors themselves. This year, the NCTR is continuing the conversation to remember the children who were taken from their homes and forced to attend residential schools. We want to make sure that everyone in Canada has the opportunity to hear from survivors and hear their truth, including the truth that many children did not make it home. Last year, the first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation came after the uncovering of graves of many missing children. Since that time, the spotlight on the history of residential schools has faded a little. But it's important that Canadians continue to learn and relearn this history. This year, we have an opportunity to continue the conversation. Reconciliation is a long journey, and it's not one that survivors and organizations that work with survivors should have to endure on their own. Everyone in Canada has an obligation to move reconciliation forward. This week, take the time to learn the role you can play in reconciliation. Listen and ask questions. Take the truths you learn and champion them. Also, remember to have empathy for what took place. Thank you for joining us. I am the turtle. I represent new life. I have witnessed creation and carry the laws of time and life on my back. 
I represent healing, wisdom, spirituality, and protection. Today, I ask you to remember the children of residential schools and take what you learn and share it so we can all heal. Remember, with truth comes wisdom and a new respect for generations to come. I am the eagle. I fly high in the sky. I carry your prayers to the Creator. I represent respect, honor, strength, courage, and wisdom. With other birds, I bring the seeds of life. As we take this journey together, I will watch over the children, honor them, and ask you to listen to the messages shared with you today through story and song. I am the buffalo. I am here to guide you and give you sustenance. I'm always here for you. Even when you are called back to the Creator and the physical life comes to an end. Today, I want you to remember that so many are on an important healing journey. Each carries important truths that we need to hear and respect. I am the polar bear. I am here to help you heal both your mind and body. The healing medicine I carry came from the elders. I share this with you so you too can help others. I ask that you share what you hear today. And remember, never stop learning, never stop exploring, and never stop loving. This is my medicine. Hi everyone, my name is Preston Totenawasis. I'm from Stanley Mission, Saskatchewan, located in Northern Saskatchewan on Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. Today I bring greetings from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, also located on Treaty 6 territory. Today's episode will be on identity and heritage. Two-Spirit Elder and Knowledge Keeper for Lori McDonald will be sharing their story and their journey in how we've gotten to where we are today. Please listen with an open heart and an open mind. These stories are very real for many of us. As a two-spirit person myself, I understand the importance of having inclusive spaces, especially in classrooms, as we spend the majority of our youth in those classrooms, and they shape the world around us. Tanse, my name is Laurie McDonald. I am Nehio from Muskegosik, which is also known as the Enoch Cree Nation. Many times throughout my years as an educator, as a social worker, or as even as a knowledge keeper, I've been asked to speak on the concept of identity or the concept of being two-spirited people. My, my stories all began here in Muskegosik, and it took me again um, many, many years to come back here. It's been a full circle. And But growing up, which would have been about maybe about 10 miles from this original site, I, memory takes me back maybe uh, when I was about four or five years old when I first heard that word that of being special. I know we all look at our children as being special, but my kokum has said, you know what? As you grow older, there's something you're going to have to, you're going to be, you're going to be given a pathway that a lot of people don't understand. And maybe today, I remember her saying those old words, maybe today you don't understand it either, but that pathway is going to be given you, re-given you that gift that the Creator had given to you. And she said, you are going to be walking in two worlds. And what it means for you, you'll, you'll find out. But I just want to caution you, you do this in a good way. That's what I remember her saying. Having gone going through life a few more years, that inclination of my, of who I am became visible, came into my mind, and and it started to make sense. And it was at that time, would have been around age nine, ten years old, I began to see that my my path was very different. 
I got a liking for males as opposed for liking uh, girls. And I couldn't really understand that yet. And I think it was not only till I entered the residential school when I actually got a, a better picture of what that was all about. People today call that uh, I, I was gay. I didn't know what that bird meant, but I also remembered my grandmother's story to me as a little child. So I did my own research as we went along in life. And uh, like a lot of other people with that persuasion, um, you, 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 you dig more and find out what that lifestyle was all about. But as a child growing up in this community, it would not have been safe for me to come out. It would not have been safe because, you know, like a lot of communities and, and a lot of influence of Catholicism and the church, and um, it was sort of, there was a bad picture painted, and it was not normal. So you sort of hid. And in our community, there are many that were there, and they chose to go underground with that feelings, go underground with that lifestyle. For me, I stayed who I am, but I also maintained that traditional concept, which the schools robbed from me. And that was the root of who I was and the roots of what my grandmother had told me. Uh, I went straight into the residential school at age 10. And right after I had finished residential school, I went into the, uh, I went into university and lo and behold, in the city of Edmonton, I was in my element because there were many people like me. I wasn't the one individual who I thought I was the only one here in community. You grow up thinking, I'm the only one. So you shrink and you hide and you just try to walk that path where you're, where everybody else is. Boys gonna play hockey, boys play baseball. And even though you didn't like it, you did it. Because if you didn't, you would have people out there who would probably cause you harm. So I left the community right a after um, I had graduated from university. I, I come home occasionally, but I never lived here because to me, I didn't feel it was safe. I went out and I went and pursued my career as a, t as a school teacher and found myself. But it took me many, many years to grasp the fact that I was not only belonging to the gay, lesbian, tr uh, transgender community, I was an individual person. I was an, I was an indigenous person with, with, a, with a rich cultural heritage. And it was not until about maybe the late, uh, uh, late 70s or early 80s when I went into um, the community in Vancouver and in, and in there, I saw many First Nation people with the same story as mine, trying to escape their communities because A, it wasn't safe, but yet they had wanted to maintain who they were. They wanted to still sing to that drum, sing with their button blankets, and or wear the regalia and still maintain the fact that I belong to the gay, lesbian, transgender community. But we face the same stereotypes within the gay, lesbian, transgender community because we were Indian. So how do you come about that? Here we are a marginalized group within a marginalized other group, and yet we're still longing to say we are who we are. So a group of us decided to establish our own organization, and it went under the umbrella as a greater Vancouver Native Cultural Society. We were able to maintain our identity of individual First Nation people. We, and uh, we could go into gay, lesbian, transgender functions, wearing our button blankets, wearing our, our regalia, and still being very proud people, and yet still maintain the fact that we were still part of two communities. As this organization grew, people would leave the organization and felt safe enough to go back home 
and uh, or their own communities or urban areas right across the country and they started their own organizations or chapters and we all had come from this marginalized group from other marginalized groups but we needed something to identify us of who we were each each culture has a name for people like us Cree people it means literally translating it means that we are walking in two worlds with medicines Basically, that's what it, it literally translates. As a collective, we, we had a gathering, a two-spirited gathering, and we decided to come up with that name, Two-Spirited People. Because if you, after you unravel that onion skin, that's what it implied. We had two spirits in us. Well, one spirit basically, basically one spirit with two persuasions, if that explains it more. So that's what the concept came up with, Two-Spirited. We always talk about roles in our communities. Yet I was sitting doing my own profession, being a school teacher, doing what I have to do and being that educator. But I had a role that my grandmother talked about, and it's a spiritual role. So I still could not really define it. What happened? And uh, and I always give thanks for this was during the height of the AIDS crisis. It took trauma, and it took an incident, a worldwide phenomenal phenomena to bring something at our footsteps, at our feet. And what the AIDS, um, what the, I call it the AIDS era, and what hit the communities, it was not only the, the, the gay, lesbian, transgender community, or the two-spirited community, it was also everybody else. So it was not specific for us as gay men and gay women, but what it, what it did was make us, force us to come forward our, with our roles. We had to bury our, 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 our members. We had to do their services, or sometimes act as that liaison between the community to the families and do that educational stuff. And people say, what did we get out of that crisis? What it did was make us, as two-spirited people, step forward and reclaim that role. Not so much as looking after the dead and dying, but being that educator and being that medicine person, encompassing all those stuff that uh, was rightfully ours, but we didn't know where it was or how to grasp it. The creator more or less put it on our feet for us to, to work with, hence creating that role. So out of that, out of that uh, crisis and that time in history, our members right across this country assumed those roles. Today, a lot of those uh, two-spirited people are doing sweats in their own community, doing medicine stuff in their own community. And, and, and establishing support systems in urban areas. So it's all out there. But it was forced on us to reclaim that role. So I had, to, so I had to, a better understanding then of what Kokum was talking to me about. I came home, I must say, off and on throughout those years. But my sister kept saying, you got to come home now. Mama said, you got to come home and retire at home. So I did. I retired at age 70, came home, and my partner was a little reluctant because of those uncertainties. But that was not to be. Everybody in this community knew who we were, and we were greeted with very open arms. You look over at our band office now, there is the, the rainbow flag is flying on top of it. You look at the school down the road, there is um, a rainbow sidewalk, which the, there are two-spirited youth there who took the initiative to say, we're here, we're not going anywhere. So it's safe for them to now to reclaim that identity as not only being um, to the gay, lesbian, transgender, and all those other acronyms, right? 
they they belong to that, but they also have a right to wear that that regalia that their spirit wants them. If they are male embodied and they want to dance and with a jingle dress, so be it, because what they're doing is bringing medicine. And the same with the with the with our our, our two spirited women who may have the uh, persuasion of dancing in men's fancy. They have that right, and they do it. I'm often asked by the elders and the pipe carriers, when someone comes across their, uh, their radar sort of thing, and the boy or the girl sit, ask, where should they sit? Because here, if the pipe carriers have the men on one side, the woman on one side, and if you have this transgendered person, where is he going to sit or she going to sit? So the pipe carriers say, go and talk to Lori. And so what I say to these uh, youth, they have a right to sit in either or. We are fortunate with most of them that they have their parents now. Their parents are their allies. Their relatives are their allies. But for that youth to understand even if they're 14, 15 years old, they want to know where should they sit in that circle with the pipe. I tell them, where is your spirit stronger today? If they say, oh, I feel like my sisters, I said, shift yourself. If they say, well, I'm male in body, but I still, today my spirit is there. I said, you sit with the men, and you could smoke that pipe. Our rights as two-spirited people all too often was uh, thrown on the wayside, and we were just considered queer. So it's a very, very uh, interesting journey. I am very, very happy, very proud, because when my partner passed, the community rallied. They understood that we were married. They understood that. He is uh, buried here in community. He wasn't from this community. He's buried there. And he had the funeral that's traditional for us. His body laid in the teepee for two days. And he had his services with, with the pipe. And elders came there. And even elders were, were barriers as they took them in. My family was very receptive, as they would for their own brother-in-laws or what have you. So it's been a full circle for me. We talk about identity. And that's what it's all about, is, is standing firm of who you are and recalling that, you know, you do have a role. And it may take years, may take a few months for you to truly understand what your journey is and what your path is. For some of us, it takes longer than a lot of people. But the thing is, uh, for those out there wanting to uh, go, go on this journey, it's good to have allies. The allies could be your, if you want to come out, it's talk to your parents. Talk to your relatives. Find someone you could talk with and feel safe. Feel safe. That's the big word here. If you don't feel safe, then widen your circle. Go elsewhere. There are there are First Nation elders out there that will listen to you and will guide you. We're all helpers in this world. Yeah, so I'm going to end it here. Exe, I'm a relations. Please join me in thanking our Two-Spirit Elder and Knowledge Keeper, Laurie McDonald. Kinnanask Moten, thank you.